<clears throat> but I don't think it's all, things are all explained by the materialist reductionist view of science. And I don't know how you can hang on to that since, uh, since quantum theory was accepted, which is quite clearly saying that there isn't a reality without consciousness being involved in it. No, Oh, baby, hold on to it. Well, yeah, hello. Hey, testing, test, is this on? Can you read me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you read me? What's up, baby? This is the Pre-Accident Podcast, and I am your loving host, Todd Conklin, and I hope you're fine. I hope all is grand with you. Everything's grand with me here. This is going to be an interesting podcast because anything that starts with John Cleese talking about um, uh, a reductionist uh, normative theory and complexity – and quantum theory uh, is going to be a pretty interesting podcast. And I, I think you'll like this one. I'm excited for it, actually. Um, you know, I'm always kind of hunting around and thinking about places where the new view crosses over into the larger society. Not because safety is not important. Safety is super important. I don't mean to downplay that by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm, I'm interested in how we can learn from others. And I know because I see who listens to the podcast, kind of. I mean, I wouldn't say I really see who listens to the podcast because I think I could, but I don't know how to do that because that would be hard. And, you know, I'm easy guy. But I know that a lot of other um, places listen to us uh, for ideas in their world, computations, uh, DevOps, um, uh, a lot of people who deal with reliable systems, um, quality people for sure. Definitely finance, all those kind of people listen. There's a good crossover. And this crossover today, I think you'll find it to be um, pretty special. In fact, I'll just tell you, I think you're going to find this to be pretty special. And I found this, and and I want to share it with you because I think it's really interesting. It's from something called the Commonwealth Club, and it stars um, Adam Savage and John Cleese. And if you don't know who those two people are, then why in the crap are you listening to this podcast? Because you should know both those people. And they're doing a really long, long interview. And this is, um, gosh, this would have been probably four years ago. John Cleese uh, had a new book out and he was on a book tour. And so I, I was just, I'd fallen into a YouTube hole, as you do. I probably was supposed to be doing something else. And um, and I know what was going on. It's, I'm trying to send... I'm trying to send out all these slides from the workshop and everything's getting denied because it's too big. And so I got frustrated because I don't know how to make it larger without making a million emails. And I'm not going to do that. I can tell you that already. So I started kind of cruising YouTube and, uh, and I found this and I got this little clip. It's not very long. Um, so don't get too excited. If you want to hear the whole thing, you should probably pull it up and hear the whole thing. It's, it's, it's a pretty interesting conversation, but it is long. It's about an hour and a half. This clip is really a discussion about, well, there's really two things that come up in this. One is, is the importance of failure in understanding success and the fact that failure is not opposite of success. That thesis comes in loud and clear, and we'll talk more about this. But I also, it makes a really good discussion around the notion of confirmation bias and how confirmation bias really drives a lot of things. I, it certainly drives our work a lot. I mean, if you do investigations, it's it's horrific. I mean, because you expect to see something and then you go out and look for it and you kind of hunt around until you find it. But it also plays in the larger scheme in philosophical um, discussions, certainly in political discussions, if you're following anything at all right now. And how could you not be? It's just it's wall to wall. It's just crazy. Everything's crazy. But this is a this is a pretty good discussion, and and it does it. John Cleese does it in a way that I think is quite remarkable, quite thoughtful. And you're going to see some crossovers with the stuff we talk about and, and what we think about, and you'll see them pretty early. And I think it's worthwhile to have this discussion. It is completely worthwhile to listen to this clip. So so let's start this podcast by playing a little clip. Now, a couple things before we go into it is he does say a naughty word about uh, three-quarters of the way into the six-minute clip. So maybe at like four minutes, 
If that naughty word is something you don't want to hear, um, beep it out with your mouth. If you have small children, um, it's a pretty naughty word. So you might not want to blab it out. But if you're just a, you're like you, you'll be fine. I mean, you'll recover from it. But it is there. And it's Adam Savage is kind of the interviewer. And really, he'll say very little. I mean, very, very little. And John Cleese is going to talk to you about sort of the the pitfalls of normative thinking, the, the pitfalls of kind of linear Newton, Newtonian understanding. And he gets there by talking about air. So without any further ado, sit back and relax, and we'll listen a little bit to uh, this interview. Then we'll come back and talk about it. Sound good? Okay, here we go. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast, and this is a special clip for you. You talk in the book about the need to to have the right attitude about failure, about yeah. being willing to approach that gulf where you're not sure how people are going to react. What do you mean having the right attitude towards failure? Well, a lot of people are terrified of making mistakes. And um, as I point out, so sometimes talk to businesses, if you try to avoid mistakes by just doing the same thing again and again because it's worked in the past, you'll make the worst mistake of all, which is that the other companies around you will overtake you. So not making a mistake will turn out to be a huge mistake. And Peter Drucker said that the, the greatest danger was, was, was rigidity, if yeah. people were too frightened of making mistakes. Because if you're going to do something new, some of those tries are not going to work. There was an interesting piece by... Um, called Krugman in the, in the New York Times this morning. And he made the point about investments that even the best people, like Warren Buffett, they occasionally make a bad investment because there's an element of risk if you try to do something new and creative. And uh, a lovely film, uh, a theatrical director in London said that when he was rehearsing a show, if there wasn't a moment when he thought this could be a disaster, then it was never a great show. Because yeah. it, you're right? Yeah, totally. Because there's a moment, what was it Karl Popper said, it's impossible to uh, foresee all the consequences of our actions. And that's particularly true if, if audiences are concerned. There's the moment, the moment you feel like you've got everything wired is the moment life is about to kick you in the balls. Absolutely. <laughs> that's absolutely yeah. right, yeah. And you can see it happening to people. They really begin to think that they know. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's dangerous. Yeah. And that they're special. Yes, <laughs> that they're special. There's a wonderful bit of research. You know Philip Tetlock? Have you no. come across this guy? No. It's mentioned in The Black Swan, which is the most interesting book I've read for years. And Tetlock wanted to find out whether these pundits, these experts on politics and economics, could make good forecasts. So he went to them and he asked them a large number of questions about what was going to happen in five years' time and ten years' time. And the fascinating thing was that they were all hopeless. <laughs> but the people who were most hopeless, and I think this is fascinating, were the most famous ones. Because when you have an idea, right, you have the affirmative bias. Yes. Which is, that if you have an idea and then you get two bits of information, one of them confirming what you think and one of them disproving it, you're much more likely to accept the one, right? Oh, yeah. So that means that you want something that affirms your bias or your, your, your prejudice. And the bigger your ego, the more certain you are that you're right and that you don't need to look at all the feedback coming in, only the feedback that proves that you're right. And that's why they were the worst people. Totally hopeless at guessing anything. Anything. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's a lovely realization. I mean, <laughs> this, is my, this is what my third book's going to be about. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's going to be called Why There Is No Hope. <laughs> You've been saying this on this book yeah, tour. I, I have, because I just got interested. It's not in this book, which, oh. Where is that book? <laughs> <laughs> I left it in the dressing room. 
I'll get Howard, my, my uh, lovely friend, to bring it in l- later on. What was I talking about? Uh, yeah, it's just the idea, which I began to get reading The Black Swan, and I think you, 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 I think you know a great deal more about this than I do, really, although you're politely pretending you don't, <laughs> is that, it, is that you, we don't know what's going to happen. And that I would take, go from there to another thing, because when I started to write a couple of books about psychology with my old therapist, who was really quite famous, I said to him one day, I said, what percentage of therapists in this country do you think that really know what they're doing? He said, 10. (laughs) He said, 10%. And after that, every time I met someone that I thought this person is special, I, I said to them, how many people in your field know what they're doing? The lowest I got was five. The highest I ever got was 20. Most people said 10 to 15. Thank you. Thank you. Most people said 10 to 15 percent of the people in their business really knew what they were doing. The rest of them just applied a set set of rules. But if they didn't work those rules, they're like me when the computer goes wrong. They don't know what to do next. You see what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's an extraordinary thought, that six out of seven people have no idea what they're doing. Well, and moreover... <laughs> you don't disagree with me, do I you? don't disagree with you at all. I think that one of the things that we <laughs> spend a lot of time doing, what a lot of those experts spend a lot of time doing, is try to hope that they know what's coming next. Yes. Because not knowing what's coming next is, well, it's genuinely terrifying. It is, ger- until you give up, till you give up hope, which is what I'm hoping, I mean... <laughs> encouraging you all to do, but once you say we don't have a fucking clue what's going on, we don't know what's going to happen, then you can just get on quietly with your life and enjoying a nice glass of wine and making as much money as you need, but not, not, not more, and, and, um, and, and the basic principle, which is trying to be kind to people, just a small number, because you can affect a small number. <laughs> if you try and change the world, I mean, it's, it's terribly funny that you think that people are going out there to try and change the world. You know, it's, it's pointless. But I don't think he means the, the bad kind of pointless. I, I, I think he means the good kind of pointless. Like, there is no hope isn't a bad no hope. It's that there is no hope. I, what, I'm dying to know what you think about this. I, you could see why I had to snip this out steal it as fast as I can and put it on the podcast for you. Uh, And I know it'll make you want to go out and and listen to the Commonwealth Club. And and you can Google this. Just Google. I think it's called Uncut Monty Python John Cleese. And uh, and it's it's the whole thing is it's very it's a very interesting. He's a funny man for sure. Um, But he's also thoughtful. But I love how he started thinking about the larger complexity of the world. And he does it through the lens of comedy. There's no question about it. So that's appealing to me. And my guess is relatively appealing to you as well. But when he starts talking about the fact that more things can happen than we could ever possibly imagine uh, imagine, or manage. That was kind of a Freudian slip there. And then when Adam Savage comes in and says, not knowing what will happen is scary at best. That, my friends, is to a great extent – a big part of the challenge that we deal with. And that challenge is, is I think best understood by stepping away from the normal way we problem solve where, where once we would say air was bad and because air was bad, we'd find places where workers did bad things, deviated away from whatever expectation retrospectively we had for them. And then we'd constrain that worker or those workers in some kind of set of constraints that would, in fact, create certainty as an outcome. The crazy thing about that, and this is what John Cleese, I think, sort of introduces to us nicely, is that that normative understanding is is very compelling, and it, it ticks all the boxes. It definitely meets the bias need we have for affirmation or confirmation. The problem is, is that it's not possible. And it's it's not possible because uncertainty, in fact, is uncertain. Um, You can quote me on that. That's totally quotable. It's not as good as my my new quote. I want to make T-shirts that say more, no, more gravy, less biscuit. That's that I'm I'm off track, but that's important. 
What Cleese is implying through many authors that he cites um, is the notion that what we can manage really is how we're prepared to understand uncertainty. And now you can go to Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe and you can talk about managing the unexpected because it's not about actually uh, the unexpected because plans can't plan for unexpected events. Unexpected is unexpected. It's about building systems that have the capacity in the long run to make a difference. So I got an email the other day from a guy who works at a relatively large warehouse operation. They're big too, and they're everywhere. And he was talking to me about the fact that people drive forklifts through open doors off the side of a dock and that that's dangerous because that will kill you. Well, yeah, that, yeah absolutely. That will kill you. And, and he said, it's a challenge because he views the problem as the open door, but his management team views the problem as the choice to drive through the open door. And he says, what that sets up is that I want to fix the open door. My managers want to fix the decision-making of every operator that drives a, a powered industrial truck. And that his comment to me was, is that it's frustrating. And, and it would be frustrating. Because the idea that somehow the worker has the agency to not drive through an open door off the edge of a dock to their death is super compelling. And it's true. I mean, you have the agency to not do that. You also have the agency to do that. The problem is, is that you don't really have the agency to see that happening in real time in an, in an environment that's constantly changing, filled with complexities and human operations. It's a function of a mistake. That's a mistake. That's an error. But that error itself, you have to ask, do we want to build a system that asks workers not to make the mistake, or do we want to build a system that expects the mistake and actually sets it up so that the worker can't fall to their death? They may still drive through the door, but maybe they hit a, a dock plate that comes up. Or, or there's a, I mean, we could think of a million ways to solve this problem, but the guys who work there are probably the best people to think of those. That really isn't an argument about free will and workers. It's really an argument about sort of a linear normative way that we see the world versus this idea of quantum thought or complexity is probably a better word for us. Quantum thought's going to take us into a bunch of directions. And that human consciousness is not the problem, that mostly what human consciousness is is the solution. And that if we see that as the problem, then what we're going to always do is we're going to build a system that by its very definition thinks air is bad. And then we'll go out and we'll be set up with these decisions. Here's a worker who had two choices, to drive through the door or not drive through the door. This worker chose to drive through the door. And so that creates the environment that gives us the payoff as a leadership team that says, aha, the problem is we got to talk to our workers. We have to tell our workers not to do that. When in fact, lots of you out there work in warehouses where it's relatively hard to drive off a dock because the ability to drive off a dock is greatly constrained by a system that won't allow that failure to take place. And it took John Cleese and Adam Savage, former Mythbuster, to have that conversation with us. And I like that. I actually like that a lot. And, and that's a really important part of what we want to talk about. And this is a pretty good little podcast. I'm not going to say much more because I don't think I have to. I think this podcast pretty much stands on its own. So without any further failure or mistake or error, let's say it this way. Learn something new every single day. And I bet you did today. It'd be hard not to. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>